gallery exclusive collections. And we've had a couple uh, little technical difficulties, but hopefully you can see me now because I saw through the live feed that nobody could see me. So hopefully that's um, resolved. But I wanted to just share today, we are very excited. We've been cleaning up the gallery. We've been rehanging, getting very excited to reopen. So our fingers are crossed that we're gonna get the green light to have at least, you know, maybe one or two people coming into the gallery at any given time. And I will be announcing that as soon as we know for sure we can do that. The, so far, the announcement has been curbside that we could deliver artwork curbside, but that might be a little challenging. We thought maybe we put the artwork out there, we'd be like those uh, sign spinners, but I don't think that's gonna work all too well. So stay tuned for more about our gallery opening. Today, I have two incredible artists um, these are wood carvers, and they come from two opposite sides of the United States. Actually, one is live streaming from British Columbia, Canada, and the other one is coming out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Both wood carvers, just very different in their approach, and both native um, artists. So I think this is going to be a very exciting show. I personally love wood sculpture. I just, I think it's one of the most amazing art forms out there. And we already had one wood carver on uh, Chad Iwalt last week. So we're kind of continuing to explore this whole art form of wood sculpture. So the first gentleman I'm gonna bring on is Luke Marston. And I think he is um, in the stream here. Hopefully he can see me now. Let's see if we can bring him on up here. Hi, hi, Luke. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I can see you now. Perfect. So it's all working. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the one thing um, with everybody on the entire planet streaming at the same time. It makes for a challenge, uh, especially on a Monday when some people are probably commercing for work too. Yeah. But how have you been with all of this? Uh, it's been pretty good. Like you know the. Uh, uh, life as an artist, like you're kind of solitude anyways, a lot of times, depending on how many people you work with. If you know, a lot of times I've worked with my brother or other artists, so especially when I'm working on bigger pieces, right? But, you know, right now it's just you know, it's good. The one thing I've really noticed the difference though is the uh, no one stops by the studio ever, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, other than that, I think that it's actually. You know, it's a scary time for sure for for people and stuff like that. But, you know, as an artist, it's time it, it helps to like be by yourself and to, you know, dream up the new things that you want to do or create and just let your mind be open with no distractions. So, you know, even as First Nations people, we go through that kind of stuff all the time, whether you're not you're doing your, you know, like a vision quest or something like that. Right. You're by yourself. and. Well, uh, one of the as an artist, you're by yourself a lot, anyways. When we were chatting yesterday, I thought was really, um, you know, so great is the fact that you were exposed to so much as a First Nations person, as a child, and then being able to go to the sweat lodges and experience that spiritual aspect of who you are as a people. What was that like? Can you give a little back, bit of background to the viewer on that? Yeah, so just for people who don't know who I am, my traditional name is Tatsumalt, and it comes from Stimaeus Mestimo, which is just the local village here on Vancouver Island in close to Ladysmith, BC. It's about an hour north of Victoria. And I grew up uh, an artist, really. My, both of my parents were uh, artists, carvers. And um, my dad, my mom is Coast Salish and Portuguese, and my dad is English and uh, Algonquin. So there's like the real local kind of uh, the Coast Salish people from here that I, you know, grew up around. But then also my dad had a sweat lodge at our house. You know, we had like 14 acres when I was growing up and he had the sweat lodge there. So I, I was introduced to that at a, at a young age, being a fire keeper and things like that. And so is, that, that, is that more of a spiritual tradition or how often would you uh, go to do the sweats? Uh, it was every weekend. 
you know, there for a while, like when I was like in 16 to, you know, my early 20s, uh, we were doing it like, it was always every weekend. I didn't attend every weekend, but it was, you know, there was always something going on. So, yeah, and, you know, they just had been doing it for a long time. And um, <clears throat> my dad had introduced it to me and I started doing it. And then later on, I moved to Victoria and worked at uh, Thunderbird Park at the museum, um, Royal BC Museum. And I was a carver in residence there for five years. That's and cool. yeah, so I, I had full, um, uh, like full contact to all the collections, full access to any kind of thing in the curator tower or anything like that. Any of the uh, audio visual stuff. And so you got the exposure of really being able to interact with those past artifacts. That, yeah. You know, folks yeah. had created, you know, your people had created for, you know, thousands of years, most likely. Yeah. Yeah, and there was, and that's really like after, you know, growing up, my mom was a cool Salish carver, so she, you know, she knew how to do the designs and stuff like that, but I went and researched more and more about the old, old stuff, and uh, as well as my brother, too. I have a brother who's a uh, career artist as well. His name is John Marston, and uh, we both just would like, it, it's way different now because you can just Google these kind of images and things like that and really research them that way right but, uh, back then you know we were like just out of high school and we would just basically go to the curator towers and find stuff and research it all and bring it back and talk to my mom about it or you know i had another mentor at that time that is the late simon charlie he was an elder of the couchin area really well-known carver That's and, uh, yeah he was he helped in a lot with just learning like the, you know, as a, as, as a young carver, showing me stuff and always helping me, so. So Coast Salish art is very interesting and I've actually been doing a lot of reading about it because I'm working on a project up in your area. But mm -hmm. what I found to be so fascinating is when you look at some of the geometric designs and you mm -hmm. look at, and you're gonna probably be able to explain better to everybody mm -hmm. watching, but this positive and negative where you have a shape that is colorful mm -hmm. and then an opposite shape that really has a negative space mm -hmm. to it. I mm -hmm. had always looked at that going up to Seattle and wherever. I always thought that that was actually a modern design, but turns mm -hmm. out this is designs that have been passed down through the generations. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like the Northwest Coast art, like there's the more northern tribes, like the more people probably would have heard is the Quagilt or the Kwakwakiwak people. And then even farther north than that is like the Haida people or the Shimsham people. And, they are, they're, and then on the west coast of the island is Michana. And then on the east coast of the island uh, is the Coast Salish. And that's like to Vancouver all the way down to Seattle. And, you know, there's like a lot of the designs are distinct between each area. As soon as you know, like our, our designs, uh, the coast here, you can tell where it came from. And then after a while you get really good, you can tell individual family styles and then you can f tell like individual people like right away. That so, is so great. I love it. And yeah. you know, I'm native, but we don't have, you know, as rich of that tradition. We have the basket mm -hmm. making and the patterns, mm -hmm. but nothing like what you're describing, which is, you know, it's almost like we have, um, you know, this tradition, almost like the Egyptians that got passed on and on, mm -hmm. but it's right here in our own backyard, which is pretty special. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, and like you think about like when the potlatch ban had happened and the, then when it was lifted, um, there was like a Mungo Martin was one of the big artists from back then, like in the 40s or 50s. And he kind of like took a hold of it with the, and he was a Quagulus artist. And then, you know, Henry Hunt and then my mentor, Simon Charlie, he was a Coast Salish. And, you know, and then of course, Bill Reed. So like they kind of grabbed hold of that 
art style that was getting lost. It was almost lost at one point. Right. And uh, now it's like really has, you know, exploded and it's back and it's strong. Like even when I started uh, as a career artist uh, after high school, uh, there was hardly any Coast Salish artists. There was like none. There were probably like four or something, right? Including myself. Right. You know, they, there's wasn't very many, but uh now you look and there's quite a few there's a bunch in seattle there's a whole bunch in uh vancouver and, and on the island so it's it's a lot better now i think that a lot of people had got to see like through you know things like facebook or instagram and things like that or yeah YouTube. there's a real resurgence i i see that well can you show the folks kind of show them your work and then describe mm -hmm. You know, I don't. I know you're not in your studio, but maybe you can share a little bit of the process of how you get the wood, and then how you create these absolutely stunning pieces of art. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, these. Well, I'll start with. Um, well, just because we were talking about the graphic design, maybe I'll talk a little bit about this. Okay, this I'm going to minimize my screen here so they can see things better. Okay, there you go. So this design is um, a base that I did in um, Stanley Park. And um, it's like kind of a traditional, real traditional, like the couch and weave sweaters. Uh, and it's just a wave design. And then th this right here again is a, a weave design too. So this is like kind of came from like the baskets or the blanket designs that we had. And I used this on the base of a, a big sculpture in Stanley Park. And um, this, so a little bit about, let's see what one of these is the best one to look at first when we're talking about design. Uh, well, any of them really. So the, um, the these feathers I started making, and this, these ones are like the smaller ones that I made. They're usually making like, they're about six feet tall and 12, 14 inches wide. And this one is uh, 32 inches long and then five inches wide. But this is a squeets, as we call in our language, which means blue jay or grandmother blue jay. So you can see, the uh, blue jay head here with the little mohawk on the top of, of her head. So this is like, yeah, the it. yeah, so the, anytime you look at like a real classic Coast Salish eye is, is this eye here with a circle with these, they're called, it was like Bill Holm who kind of coined the term um, trigon. Uh, right. I don't really know. I don't know the Halkamenum word for it in our language, but I'm working on talking to elders, trying to get it. But um, so the circle with the trigon on either side, that's a really classic. You see that in all the old, old stuff. And then um, the consecutive crescents, like all the way, coming all the way up like this. Those little C shapes are called crescents. And we use those a lot to, to or feather designs or uh, scales on like serpents or uh, salmon or things like that. So, and then how you were talking about the positive and the negative shape. So just like the, this area here, all these filled in the colored area would be considered the positive and then the negative shapes are the wood color uh, shapes in here. And that typically- And what is the wood that you use? Uh, so yellow cedar, mostly we use red and yellow cedar. Um, okay. It's considered a uh, tree of life to our people because it gave everything to us. Like uh, as far as our um, clothing is, was made from the bark, the inner bark and uh, our houses were made out of it, split into planks, um, our canoes for living. Those were made out of it, like any kind of masks, anything. So we use, the Western red cedar is probably the most. That's that bear mask here behind me. Okay. That's a, a red cedar, and this is the yellow cedar. That is yeah. so beautiful, Luke. What a gorgeous design, and it's the finish is so smooth on those feathers. And then do you do you take it and do you carve the feather first and then paint over it? Yeah. So the 
you know, I just make it like a blank sheet. So carve it into a feather. And then, you know, I try to, you can see the lip, like it kind of curves up like this. And then it also curves like this, right? So it's quite a thick piece of wood when I start on them. And um, yeah, so I just create the feather. And then after I have that, then I start to design and kind of keep in mind what I'm going to do for design, um, what kind of bird I'm going to depict. Uh, this one here is, uh, this is all white. This is a white raven. Oh, I love that. So again, in our, in our story, so there's the raven's eye and then the beak. So it's there, and then this is just like abstract feather designs and stuff with these these trigons and and within our stories, it was the raven who was the one who um, who stole the sun from the seagull. The seagull owned the sun and had it in a box, and uh, and he wouldn't let it out. And the raven is never satisfied and always wants things that's shiny and beautiful and so he knew that the, the seagull had had the sun so he went there and when and when this was happening in the beginning of a time when the whole world was black because the seagull had the sun the raven was white and then when he tricked the seagull out of the sun he scorched himself with the sun and he turned himself uh, black so that's what the white raven story and we have a similar story um, yeah with other people. yeah it's interesting how the creation stories have um, connected uh, native people from all over the country you know they vary but there are, there are definitely some similarities that's mm -hmm. gorgeous and do you, have you taken those feathers and done some large installation works that are public uh no mostly what i do is um I sell them like directly, but also I deal with the Inuit gallery in Vancouver. Okay. And, and um, Douglas Reynolds gallery in Vancouver as well. Okay. And, cool. um, yeah. And I, I do sell a little bit in Seattle to uh, Steinbrook gallery and um, yeah, that's probably both in Seattle. So those are, but cool. those are mainly my, my three galleries that I do work with. And I do do, like I have lately been doing more and more public art, but these would be fantastic to be a public art piece. If they really know. would be. I could see that, you know, just like in an entry coming into, uh, you know, a facility or even, you know, a healing center because the feathers are so healing. And mm -hmm. what about the piece behind you? That looks pretty spectacular. Yeah, so this piece here is um, this is a, a bear mask. So uh, I'll stand up aside so you can see the scale. Look at that. So it's pretty big. And this is uh, a black bear, bear mask. Now, is that one piece of wood or several pieces? No, this is one piece. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, because the cedar trees that we use are the old growth trees. And uh, they're quite large. They're huge, a lot of them. So, yeah, that's uh, a mask that I'm doing for, um, I'm putting together a show. I don't particularly know where it's going to be, but um, that's one of the pieces this piece right here behind me i don't know if you can see it that well but yes we can see it it's amazing also so this is kind of speaking of creation stories this is one of um an origin story of in our history or snowyeth it's called the there was 12 beans that fell from the sky and when they fell from the sky they had they were birds and they transformed into humans so this guy's his name was the first one was uh, Sayaletsa, and um, his this is actually like feather headdress around his top, and then he's doing out a welcome figure because that's another really common thing for the Coast Salish is the welcome figures, and uh, it's going to be at an entrance to an agency here in Cowichan or in Duncan. 
So it's a, it's kind of a, a symbol for hospitality and, and welcoming. Yeah, and it's just a real classic. Like a lot of people know the story of Sialatza. And uh, he was, when he first came, he landed on Mount Prabol, which is one of the biggest mountains here. And um, he walked around and he had a staff with him and he had a little dog. And uh, the creator had told him to bath in every river, stream and lake. And to that would give him spiritual strength and guidance. So that's like it's called Shahwayas or Shakum in our to our people. And that's like when you uh, are trying to do a vision quest is one reason why you would do it. But also even just to keep yourself spiritually strong and um, on a daily basis, just going and giving gratitude to the creator and to um, Mother Earth for, for the day. And you would bath in that river with uh, cedar boughs and uh, to start your day. That's wonderful. So so when, you, when you're creating your work, I'm going to bring myself back up here so that I can. Okay. When, when you're creating, do you are you do you feel like you're in touch with your ancestors and you're bringing through these creations through your hand? Is it like that, or what is your thought process when you're when you're working? Yeah, like oh, for sure, um, it's like that. Like you want to always try to be in tune with those uh whoops wrong way this way sorry uh yeah try to be in tune with uh that kind of thing like you know our ancestors were the masters of this art form they created the art form so it's always trying to be as you know um as good as they were at executing this art form and staying true to to its style but also you know, living in today's society and doing more contemporary things. So, right. Yeah. Now, do you have children, Lou? Yeah, I have two daughters. And are are you passing on these traditions to to your girls? Uh, yeah, as much as I can. Like you know, the, they're teenagers, and you know, even myself. Even though I was a carver I, when I was a teenager, I, it's uh, you know kind of a tough thing to get kids involved until they want to be involved right, right. so you know I but i also do know, teach. So i know that <laughs> yeah i also do teach though um uh kids in foster care twice a week well mm -hmm. since the pandemic they haven't done it. i did some videos for them and got them to draw some stuff but other than that yeah i haven't done anything what uh, a great point um, that's such a great way to get back I love that. Oh yeah, I love it for sure. I never, I never seen myself as a teacher, like especially you know when I was younger and stuff. I didn't. I just felt like I traveled a lot and I learned from a lot of different people, and I always felt like I was just still learning so much that I just, I didn't have an, enough time to give back, or I didn't feel right. like I knew enough to even try. Like I felt like there was other people, you know, like my parents or somebody else who had more knowledge that would be a better suited as a teacher. It's but, funny know, how, how time changes, huh? We are now we become the parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Giving back, right? Because uh, yeah, that's how it works. And it's great that you're doing that. Well, your work is powerful and just so well executed. And that was what really caught my eye. I've been following you for a while now on Facebook. I think we may have had a mutual friend, but mm. where can people find your artwork if they want to follow you or collect your work? Where is the best way to reach out to you? Uh, well, the, definitely through my Instagram and my um, Facebook artist page. Uh, okay. the, the ones where I get back to people the most. Um, I don't have have a website right now. It's like down. Well, it was up, and then it was in, down, and then it's up. I don't know. <laughs> What's it like our live streaming here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, no. So mainly through there, but then also to you know just googling my name and um, looking through the Inuit Gallery and uh, Douglas Reynolds Gallery are the two main galleries that I sell to. Okay. But, uh, well, you know, I, we may we may put our hand up once we get started, and I'm wanting to curate a um, like a native indigenous art uh, show here at some point with the gallery. So you oh might yeah, that would be great. Yeah, 
that'd be yeah. awesome for sure. People would love your work. Well, yeah, thanks I'm so much. Having, uh, Sorry. Thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. Okay. And I, thanks we love you. And um, definitely, let's stay in touch. And then, you know, as things go on, maybe you know, when you get back into your studio, we can have you on again, and you can actually show us, you know, the actual carving. I know right now you're not in your studio and that was really kind of a fun thing to hear your story about the studio, but I'll save yeah. that for the next time. Yeah, I'm actually working on a big 45 foot Doug Oak canoe right now. So that's pretty exciting to see. So yeah, I would love to share that with you guys as well. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Well, mm -hmm. thanks again, Luke. Everybody, <laughs> we'll put it up on the screen here um, where you can find this work. And I think I tagged it on Facebook so you guys can just Click on there, follow his page, and see all these beautiful works inspired by the tradition of the First Nation Coast Salish artists. So thanks again, Luke, and blessings to you and your family. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'll see you again. Okay, bye now. It's always a treat to have these artists that are coming from places where they're pulling from the traditions of people who have been part of their lineage for you know thousands of years and we have another artist coming on and he has he has he comes from actually two different tribes i have a couple of his gorgeous pieces that i happen to be lucky enough to own in my own collection and that's lx lewis so let's see if we can get lx um, live streaming here from santa fe actually i think he's in albuquerque And there he is. Welcome to the show. No. How's it going? Can you see me? Good. I hear your little ones in the background there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's right in here. We're kind of sharing oh, the, our, uh, our studio. She's a uh, four. Oh, that's such a great age. So welcome to Art of the City. And I've been uh, talking up a little bit. I have your beautiful sculptures here. But why don't you share with uh, the folks here what you've been doing? Because I know you, you're such an accomplished sculptor and um, doing these wood carvings. And then the last time I saw you at Indian Market in Santa Fe, you had gone back to school to learn how to take these creations and bring clay into a bronze medium. So what, how's that been going for you? It's, uh, it's been a long journey. Um since I started uh, back up at school, um, it's uh, I started back uh, myself and my family. We've been uh, here since 2007 in Santa Fe, New Mexico, um, at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, I'm actually a returning student, so I was here back in 2001. Um, but uh, at the time, I just didn't know what type of art I was. Uh, I just like to draw. Um, so I thought I was going to be a painter, but I ended up coming out of the school back then, um, working in 3D. Um, yeah, it's I interesting work, how yeah. artists, a lot of artists will start with one medium, and then it's almost like you have this pull to do something that they didn't think they were going to be doing. And I think that's what you had shared with me before. Yeah, it, it's uh, um, going to art school or just being taught by somebody. Um kind of helps you find you know you gravitate to you know your gift or w whatever you're passionate about i drew a lot so i thought you know you know when you're drawing um different characters or just drawing and doodling um you're assuming that you're just going to be a painter you know and because that's kind of like in a sense the next step of becoming a artist but you know it's that's really not the case um I ended up just uh, gravitating to the, or, you know, uh, a lot of my mentors ha have been um, three-dimensional artists, you know, some stone carvers. And, and um, I did work with clay back in 2003, um, but that was very minimal. Uh, right. But uh, it, it just, you know, wasn't enough for me to actually full get full blown on it because of uh, uh, my situation at the time. So well, then I well, ended up don't know that when once you start getting into bronze that's a whole that's a whole animal in itself because unless you've got somebody sponsoring it early on it's probably one of the besides being talented 
just having the bronze cast, um, it's pretty expensive. I've worked with a lot of bronze sculptors before and getting that off the ground is, you know, it, it requires quite a bit of capital. Yeah, it does, especially if you're on your own and, and um, you're on a minimal budget. And um, for me, too, like uh, I came up, you know, I for, you know, a little brief rundown about my my life history. Um, I pretty much was on my own since I was like 10 years old. You know, I I ended up in, you know, foster care, you know, right around that age. And, you know, it just pretty much been living life, you know, by myself and understanding things about myself. So I didn't really have a great, you know, mentors and as a child. So the art became, you know, my guidance and by under, by working with different other artists, um, as a, as a young artist, that was kind of my mentor that I was kind of losing or my, you know, my, you know, something that was passed on to me. And I, I think I felt comfortable with that. You know, I think that was my, my place. Now you are, your background is your, I can't remember. Is it your mom or your dad? Is the name? Yeah. My, yeah, my, uh, my mom, I was born in South Dakota and my mom is Cheyenne River. She, her, her, her affiliated tribe is in Cheyenne River, Eagle Butte. Um, so I'm part Cheyenne and, um, my dad is, uh, Navajo Diné uh, from Arizona. Okay. So I actually lived with them till uh, probably I was about ten or nine years old, and I, I moved to live with my mother in South Dakota. So I was like this Navajo speak. Well, I I spoke, you know, I was I spoke Dene Dene Baza, and when I went to South Dakota, there wasn't really anybody that I can relate to as a Navajo person, but I also was, you know, part Cheyenne. Right. So it, it was just kind of a hard struggle during that time, you know. Well, but I, I you think know. even now, I mean, a lot of folks think, you know, I always hear this thing. Oh, you know, um, Native, you know, Native Americans are, you know, wealthy. They get all of these goodies. And the truth of the matter is that it's only, I think, 2% of Native populace that have casinos that are gaming that are actually living above the poverty line. And I think you probably fell into the latter, especially be, because, you know, that was before gaming. So yeah. I understand, you know, it's not uncommon for people to be out on their own at a very young age, you know, at 10 years old, or in my case, you know, at 14, you know, it's kind of a struggle. And then I think you have found solace in your art. I found solace in the arts and I know countless people that's their story. So it's yeah. a really great one. Yeah, it, it's just, a, I guess it's it just been a guide for me. Uh, like, you know, a lot of us, you know, we need like a path or we need to kind of really understand who we are as a person. And especially us indigenous uh, or in the indigenous community, we we struggle with that. And um, it's just, it, that's just what happened. You know, it's nothing that anybody did wrong. It's just what we were given, you know. And it's and, what you make out of it that matters. Yeah. Yeah, That's exactly. It. Well, so, I, want, yeah, that, I want you to okay. talk a little bit about these pieces. I'm going to kind of move this one over here a little bit. But this was the first piece that I collected from LX. Absolutely stunning. And made me it looks pretty cool. big, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm sitting down, and yeah. well, this is like – one of my children here. I love this piece so much. So why don't you share with the folks a little bit about this piece, Water Child, and what it's made out of and how you executed this? Well, uh, I was fortunate enough to, um, to move to uh, from Santa Fe uh, back in 2003. I moved to California, and I've been residing in California for ever since then until now. Um, I'm still We still live there. My kids are from there. So I was, uh, you know, kind of trying to get into the art business um, since I just freshly came out of art school here in Santa Fe back in 2003. Uh, but I didn't, you know, have a, a niche. And I was, uh, I, I was participating with the gallery uh, art show called Sarah Art Trails. And I ended up meeting a, a fellow that 
He carved Manzanita in, in California. Manzanita is pretty much predominant in um in the higher elevation. So I lived up in the foothills. So it just pretty much grew out the front door or, you know, I opened my door and pretty much you see Manzanita laying around. So my idea of, of uh, uh, carving a, a piece of wood, I, I just, you know, you know, I wait till, you know, I, when I go hunt, I pretty much hunt a wood or a piece of uh, piece of wood that I want to carve. I, I look for um, a particular piece that is already dried and already, you know, ran its course in this lifetime. So it's maybe either laying on the ground or pretty much all gray and you wouldn't really notice, you know, you wouldn't really take a second look at it. Right. So what I do, uh, I have, uh, I, I grab it, you know, um, if it, if it speaks to me and, um, what I would, you know, sometimes I go hunt for wood, you know, take all day and I'll pr sometimes I wouldn't even come back with anything. Hmm. And when I do come back with something, then uh, I end up, uh, it's pretty much all gray and it's uh, pretty much, you know, dead. And uh, the reason why I, you know, grab the, you know, cured and gray pieces is the moisture is pretty much out of it. And it's already ran its course in, in this lifetime, as, as I said. And I bring another life into it. And um, yeah, and, and that's what it is. And, and I bring it back and, and I try to help. Uh, try to, uh, I guess, with my message, try to help people understand um, that that wood has life, you know, and and it, it still speaks, and that no matter if it's gray or dead, and I just try to give people, more, more, uh, I guess, a lot more appreciation mm -hmm. for the plant life, all the green living things around us, and and when uh, I always get amazed when I do my art shows. Um, People always, you know, ask me, did you do that? You know, that that's one thing I always, you know, that kind of fulfills me as an as an artist and as a as a person that, you know, opens people's eyes and, and some people get surprised. And it's it, it just it just yeah, it just kind of helps me with with my own, you know, self healing. So and plus at the same time, it's, you know, something for the environment. So with this piece, it's uncanny because this is called Water Child, right? And this yes. almost looks like water. This particular piece of wood, I don't know how you wondered that or if it's just something you saw in the wood prior, but this almost has water, like a water-like pattern dripping all through this piece of manzanita. Yeah, that's, I, I study the piece of, you know, it doesn't come like that at first. It, it just comes like a block or a piece of wood. And But I always try to... Um, let the wood speak, I guess. That, that's my motto is, is uh, I always let this, people ask me, said, uh, they said, they always ask me, like I was saying, you know, uh, you do this? And I said, no, I, I have a partner that helps me. And they kind of look at me weird and I, or they kind of look at me and say, who? And I say, you know, the piece of wood. Because, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to butcher, you know, the wood is already, a, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a elegant and it's, you know, gnarly, and it's uh, something exotic to look at before it's even carved. So, I don't want to take that away from the the piece of wood. And a lot of a lot of the times, they always ask me if I stain the wood, and I say, you know, this is the natural color of the wood. You know, and I I, I use that to my advantage, and and therefore it's like uh, think smart, you know, so you don't have to work harder. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it's yeah, it's understanding the yeah. And I know the, in this the flow. Piece, you're kind of known for these inlays. So I don't know if the viewer can see that, but this is all turquoise in here. And there's this beautiful turquoise inlay here. Yeah, putting that in, it's um uh, I, I use crushed turquoise. I crush turquoise myself and um that's a time timely task too, is just to add, you know, a little type of uh you know, a little any it just gives a little accent. Um just because uh, if, since I'm part Navajo, um, we have a lot of turquoise um, in our culture. And we have that a turquoise brings us power and it protects us. So I, I really try to always use turquoise in, in a lot of my work. And, well, this um, one is stunning. It's, on. hard, it's hard for the folks to see, but I'll just kind of, I'll kind of uh, narrate what I'm looking at here. There are these very intricate, feathers 
inside of the mother's hair here and all of this carving that you do, it's just so intricate, like every little stroke inside the sculpture is really quite amazing. And even in the, the baby's face, um, it's so smooth and then this beautiful little ribbon piece around there. Um, this must have taken you a really long time to do. Yeah, it, it, eventually it, I keep, you know, a lot of times I feel I'm not finished, but that, that's just probably the, um, I'm, I'm kind of in a somewhat um, perfectionist. Um, I can sit uh, and I have a lot of patience, I guess. Sometimes I just sit for hours and, and just work on one section. But the thing about working with wood, it's, it's, it's organic and it's, um, you know, the, it, you know, organic things you don't have or, you know, pretty much are kind of unpredictable in a sense. So when you work with something that's really unpredictable, you have to understand how it works before you can really um, work with it, you know, that's because even though it's, sense. you know, dried up and, and um, don't have any water running through it, it still breeds, you know. So one thing about working with dried wood, you still have to protect it because it eventually sometimes it'll, it'll crack, you know, because wood will still breathe and expands, especially in different environments. Depends where you are, too. Piece here, Alex, uh, the healer. This was the piece that I fell in love with at Santa Fe at the um, at Indian Market. And now, is this bear skin? Is that a traditional um, piece from a ceremony that you brought? Well, to yeah. Uh, since I've been uh, in California for uh, you know going on 18 years uh, my kids tribes they they're uh, you know I've been to a number of uh, bear dances uh, and, and the bear offerings and, and this is something where in other tribes also do it too not just uh, California but it just was a time for me to do something like this uh, a lot of times I don't know what I'm going to carve you know people always tell me to you know carve you know bears or animals or eagles people like those you know but it's it, it's really up to the wood you know if i find the right piece uh, then i could uh if i see a bear or see something then i could put that on there i, I really don't really do animals too much but um it, it all depends what i you know what i see in the in, in the actual wood piece and like i said i always let the wood speak and this you is know, it, yeah. It I just love said, the little tail. Now, how how did you get the tail on there? The tail was already there. It, it was just a little nub um, um, from the from the growth of the wood. That grew. was perfect. Yeah, it just ended and, up coming. I and just then let my hand. Turquoise paws. These inlaid turquoise uh, paw prints are just amazing. Really intricate as well. Yeah, that that took some time too to actually add that in there, but it it just um, you know sometimes I could just say oh it's finished, but um, like I said, uh, um, I, I always like to you know be happy with what I what I do, and um, it, it it pays off in the long run. Um, it just looked like a bear dancer when it, when I seen it. It's like oh, man, that you know that's like a bear dancer, and that's kind of like that's actually my first. Uh, actual bear my first bear carving in a sense of a, a bear dancer but we the, the bear dancing um what you do is the the uh, you know either medicine man or or somebody would go and um get a bear and um because the bears are known to uh, have medicine and that's how we learn how to eat you know back in the right you know we watch the bear and how they eat the berries or you know how they lived and that's how we learned and they had the medicine so when we needed uh, help in our our community um we had a you know we, we ended up inheriting the bear spirit and that we became the, the the medicine of the bear dancer and when you dance you help heal the community and at the time when i was making that too um it, it was a the right time to do stuff and especially the the water child too i actually i had uh, you know that baby came on there because i actually had a new baby and, and now she's uh 
Um, I didn't have it, but um, <laughs> we hear but, her in the background. <laughs> yeah, but she yeah she's four now, so it, so a lot of this, a lot of my stuff is really um, personal and comes from my heart, and and that's where you know a lot of my art you know I see is that. generated from you know. So I think all of every piece that I've seen that you've done, and I think one of the things that has really impressed me besides the fact that you're such a great talent and I enjoy these pieces every day I see them and I they bring me a lot of joy is um, the way that you are such a great father and the way you're raising your kids and how you've really made a lot of sacrifice to keep in the arts also by having a family and that's a pretty impressive and rare thing you know because the art you know, the art field isn't always, you know, doesn't yeah. always have, it's not the most lucrative all the time. And it's also something that, you know, you just really don't know where it's going to take you, but what you're creating will be here forever. And it's speaking of your journey and then also the journey of your people. So I think that's such a great uh, legacy to leave to the whole world, including your kids. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, um, especially before we came to uh, school here, um, we just pretty much, uh, in a sense, sold everything and just traveled over here. Um, and we lived in a 22-foot trailer for two months before we had school. So we lived in in the park grounds. We we stayed at a couple casinos. We stayed at Walmart in our in our trailer. So living, we have a I have a family of five. So I have two boys and the missus and one one my little baby. We lived in that twenty-two foot trailer for two months before I before we actually got the chance to um, move on campus here at at the school. Okay. So, so you that were, was you experience. Were you had the you had already gone through all that. <laughs> so yeah, so that that was the experience to to travel with the um, our family, especially when at the time my my little girl was one years old, so she was still a little baby. Uh, so she pretty much grew up here in Santa Fe um, most of her life at, at the school. So I kind of just joke around with my kids. I say, you guys are in college now. <laughs> That's it. But, so yeah. show us, um, I don't know if you have one of your bronze that you want to kind of finish up the show with. Show us where you're heading because I well, know you mastered this and now you're going on. And I think one of the things we spoke about was as much as you love wood carving, it's so time consuming that you it would be very difficult to really show in multiple galleries and so moving into bronze even though it is quite costly um, you are able to create an addition of bronze sculptures so that you can place those in more than one gallery yeah um that, that's one reason why i i um i came back uh to to art school here not to only um finish my my degree because I, when I left, I didn't finish my degree. So I'm actually, um, uh, getting my BFA in um, studio arts. That's great. So, yeah, so that's something, um, and I was able to learn the, the art of, um, doing a bronze because the, the bronze process, I was able to pour my own bronze. I was able to do my own waxes. Um, for some of you that don't know, the bronze, we do the last, the lost wax process, which uh, you melt out the wax, then you have a hollow um, ceramic shell, then the ceramic shell holds the bronze. So then I actually weld, because when you do a bronze, it don't come out the like an actual piece. It comes out, you have to do it in sections. So you have to weld it together. So I was able to learn, I'm able, you know, I can weld, TIG weld um, the bronze metal, which bronze metal is, is a little bit... Um, complicated and especially using a TIG weld. So, so I got a lot of uh, knowledge and not only that, um, I was able to um, become a silversmith too. Um, so that, that was one, a, a plus um, here at the school. And but what's yeah, this the is, title of this one, this bronze piece? This one, I have two of these ones. Um, I have, uh, I forget what the title is because, uh, I actually redid this one. I actually put the turquoise inlay in the, and this actual bronze. And this was really hard to do, especially working in, in bronze. 
So I was, I was able to, I just, like I said, I try to incorporate turquoise in my work and it just, it was tedious, but you know, it, you know, now I can say, Oh, I put turquoise in the bronze, but my whole, um, idea, I wasn't going to really high polish this part. Um, eventually. Um, so I'm kind of still working on this piece, but I have another piece that's still uh, packed away. That's, um, but that's beautiful. I, I believe it was the gift because the gift basket, that's what it was. So my whole intention was to actually add um, some type of, uh, it could be, these right now are pretty much hollow or they don't have anything in the basket right now. Um, but eventually I'm going to put uh, different either turquoise um you know some type of uh, crystals or you know something that can hold that holds greater power um within us uh, to add to this uh bronze because the reason why i like working with wood and um it's so warm you know and when you work with metal people always think it's really cold and and it's you know doesn't handle life so I, I always like to incorporate different things into my um, pieces. So it's um, kind of like a mixed medium thing that I have. And this is uh, this is uh, since our school actually where I'm still in school. This is at my last week in um, of school left. But we all went. We the school got closed, so all the studios and this is the art school. So all the studios got closed. So if you're going to be an artist, obviously you need art studio. So we're kind of on lockdown right now too. So this is, I had to make a, this little room here into my little art studio now. And, um, this is how the plasticine clay, and we have the, we're, we're, um, very, uh, a lot of students here are, um, um, very, um, we, we have the option of making our own plasticine clay. So that, that's one thing we can learn too. So oh, the that's a Piece that we're looking at right there with the with the bird yeah the it's a, yeah the little okay. hummingbird okay um my whole idea was gonna i was gonna cast this piece into a bronze but we ended up getting on lockdown so that had to wait later. And, yeah later. so with Beautiful. this i was gonna make this piece right here the, the hummingbird was gonna be um high polished um chrome or aluminum so when you look when you look at the piece, you won't necessarily see the piece um, because it'll be so reflective in a sense of a chrome or high polish right. uh, idea. Yeah. And yeah, um, stunning. I, I love that design. Very nice. But well, this is just a rough, rough part. Or uh, let me show you the whale. And I have a, a whale piece that I'm working on too. So hopefully eventually I could get that, those done. So you but, have... Yeah. You ha you're still doing wood sculpture, even though you're kind of working towards perfecting the bronze as well, right? Yeah. Um, eventually, I want to go uh, larger um, to do more public installations pieces. Um, so that's that's kind of uh, my what, one of my other goals. Um, well, like you said, my art. Your work is just incredible. And what I think that, you know, I'd like to share with the viewer is it really is impressive when an artist has reached this level in one medium and then says, oh, wait, that's not enough. I need to come back and go back to school and learn how to work in a whole new medium. Uh, that takes a lot of courage. So I think it's really, um, it's impressive to see that you're willing to take that risk. So now we're going to not only see these wood pieces, but be able to see the bronze as you, you know, continue to work and perfect those. So, oh, yeah. I'm gonna show you. Um, this is one of my bigger pieces. It's a. Uh, it's not finished yet, but uh, it's gonna have a like a hummingbird on an edge, and these gonna be flower petals. So it's a, it's a um, metal still construction. So you're pretty busy. You've got a lot going on. Well, I yeah. really appreciate you being on the show today, and we want to follow you. So you, I know you're on Facebook, right? Is that the best way for people to keep in touch with your work? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. I have uh, The Wood Speaks and Artwork by Alex Lewis um, on my Facebook like page, and I also have, you know, 
what you have right now. Um, when you tag me, Alex Lewis. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and I'm then also on Instagram. Yeah. Before we leave, I know that uh, you're you have a little side project going there with these really cool T-shirts that are uh, helping oh, yeah. keep the uh, food on the table, right? Yeah. Before, like, I actually, I'm I'm kind of like, a, in a sense, a hustler. <laughs> um, and it, just because I was using my art, uh, I I I was trying to use I use my art as to try to stay in the art business, so. I try to use different methods of um, earning income because, you know, obviously I have the family to feed and um, some people can't afford, you know, some of my, you know, wood carving. So I have to, you know, kind of, imp imp you know, improvise, I can't say. So yeah. I, I've been doing t-shirts for about probably 10 years. Okay. Um, just about as long as I've been carving uh, my sculptures, um, my wood carvings, but I've actually been, been doing wood, um, been, uh, before I started doing wood carvings, I was actually carving stone, believe it or not. I remember seeing that. So where do we find yeah. your t-shirts? Yeah, they'll be on my um, Facebook uh, Facebook page, LX uh, Lewis. So I'm um, actually giving a, um, two free shirts away um, after we get done speaking here. Oh, good. Um, so that's yeah. a good reason to go, folks. Go, go sign up for that. And I also do some ledger art, so I'm working on some ledger art. So I actually would be given some. Um, I'm going to be given um, actually one of my ledger drawings uh, too. So we'll check just stay that tuned. Out. Well, it sounds like your little one is uh, wanting to get on the stage. There, you might have the next budding artist. But I really appreciate you coming on today and. Um, you know, we'll we'll spread the word and support you and your effort. And I cannot wait to see those bronze sculptures because I know that as incredible as these are, I know you've been working really hard on that. So give me blessings yeah. to your, fam your family and thank you so much again for being on the show today. And we're going to follow you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for actually uh, inviting me. That that was pretty cool. It's, it's always great to to meet up with you because you're so creative. You've got so many things going on. So appreciate you being here, and um, you guys be well there, and we'll be looking forward to seeing what you're doing next. Yeah. I, um, I, my next project is probably be doing some more uh, wood carving. Okay. Well, and, we'll uh, get, ready, get ready for my next show. Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. You guys be well, and we will catch back up to you on the probably, you know, as you progress on these, and we can bring you back on the show. Okay. Okay. Take care. Yeah. You too. Okay. Bye. Doksha. That's one of those folks that you really have to admire because he's all in. He's done everything that he can to become a successful artist. Um, he's had quite a bit of success with his wood carving, but it's tough in certain mediums if you, you know, it takes a really, really long time to create something like this. It's really limiting to an artist to their, you know, ability to make a living and be in galleries and that type of thing. This is a probably a little bit more challenging medium, especially if you have a family. So I really appreciate someone like LX because he kind of shows us that artist struggle. But I appreciate you guys being on the show today, Art of the City, live streaming here from Facebook. Join us Wednesday. We have an art legend coming on the show on Wednesday, and that's Robert Lynn Nelson. For those of you who don't know who that is, go ahead and Google him. He was really the originator of the art concept where you had the beautiful marine life, above the water and then the sea below and the sky above. And he was really the trendsetter in Hawaii in the early 80s who created that concept. And then many artists, like all artists, they feed off of each other's ideas. Then you had other artists like Wyland and Lassen and many other Hawaiian artists that came on the scene. But he was the original and he's gonna be on our show. And then we also have a gentleman who's going to be sharing with us about plain air art. He is the president of, I believe it's called the plain air society. So he'll be coming on just kind of sharing what plain air art is all about. So we'll see you live streaming Wednesday, 1 PM here, California time 
Art of the City live streaming here on Facebook. Have a great day, folks.